It's funny. I see all of these clips of James Harden talking, and all I hear is Kenny. What? A, what He's I, just there's no. I, there's just clips of his podcast. They're on my feed, and all I don't you hear. Mean Draymond. I, yeah, Draymond. Oh, I was about yeah. to say, I had done a James Harden. No, I'm sorry. You, uh, so I said James Harden because he was talking about James Harden being an all-star. Um, but I'm looking at him, and all I hear is Kenny. That's all I can hear. I mean, I did, that wasn't a cue for an impression at all. Real with it's ourselves. Not, yep, it was my fault. To be completely honest, James Harden is playing at an all-star level. Yeah. And quite frankly, if you understand the game of basketball, James Harden should be an all-star. Your thoughts, Shaq? No, 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 no. As we welcome James Ham here uh, of the of the insiders. What's going on, James? How is you that, doing? Is that uh, James Harden speaking in the third person? That was Draymond. That was Draymond. Oh, that's Draymond. Yeah. Got it. I don't have a James. James is, I kind of know what he's saying. I'd have to work on that. It's a little mumbly. Yeah. yeah. No, I know James Harden. Yeah. Daryl Morey is a liar. <laughs> I repeat, Daryl Morey is a liar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, James Ham, fresh from King's practice. Uh, I feel like I know the answer to this, but maybe you could fill us in a little bit. I got the idea. Mike didn't talk about anything other than what happened in Golden State or uh, with uh, the Golden State Warriors coaches. Yeah, it was all it was all of that. It, yeah. Like uh, five minutes, basically four or five minutes, me and Sean and I think Sam asked a question understandable um yeah he he took it hard and uh it was pretty emotional and you know like it's the guy he spent an entire year with you know in, in golden state and those things are tough you know uh especially you know he's got kids uh married with kids and 46 years old is insane. 46 absolutely and insane he's a big guy big like six foot seven mm. like a monstrous of a man like big teddy bear guy and mike Mike took it pretty hard. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he's really close with Steve Kerr still and probably knew it early, early, early this morning, what was happening. Cause it sounded like it was uh, like, there was not a whole lot they could do. Yeah. It felt time. like when the, it, it went from, there was a medical emergency to the game being canceled. Yeah. It was like, yo, that escalated quick. This isn't good. Yeah. This isn't yeah. Good. yeah. Yeah. Very, very sad. Very sad. Um, did you guys get the opportunity? I'm going to attempt to transition to like the basketball stuff. I just wanted to like, there's, there's not going to be sound from Mike Brown breaking down what happened in the last six minutes last night because of what happened um, with the Golden State Warriors. But did you guys get to talk to anybody? Was anybody made available for you? Did anyone talk about what happened last night? We spoke to Trey Lyles. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we were turned down or others, okay. uh, which came as a shock because we had been waiting for like 45 minutes, hmm. uh, at least. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, Trey was, uh, like, the team is is not super happy with what happened. Uh, they clearly understand that that they uh, these last two losses were self-inflicted. That's hmm. what Trey said. And I mean, that makes a lot of sense, like that they're taking ownership of the losses and saying they've got to be better and everything else. Uh, at the same time, like, look, this team has been a work in progress from the beginning of the year. And you can look at it all kinds of different ways, but, you know, the, their inability to consistently perform on a nightly basis has been pretty shocking. And the last couple of games, I thought that they were better as a team. And then they fell apart late. And so sort of the natural progression of a team growing and trying to figure things out, that makes sense to me. But I'm just surprised it took 40 games to get to this point where we're finally worrying about how to close out a game and all that. Because for the bulk of the season, either they blow out teams or they get blown out. That's mm -hmm. it. Yeah, just a, just a weird season so far. It is a, a weird, weird season. A weird season. You know, things playing out in, in a strange fashion. I've I've been speaking all day, James, about how uh in a in a weird way, I think the Kings are playing playing good basketball. That state's ain't good. I don't know, but they're playing solid basketball right now. Even with the with the two losses that just happened, a two and three five game road trip, um, that I was ex Expecting, not expecting, but I was looking for them to go three and two at least, and you lose the last two games the way you are. Is it out of pocket? Is it inconceivable 
for me to think that they're playing better basketball, there's little things that they have to take care of and shore up to to solidify a win in some of these close games. But I think they're they're playing. I think they're playing good basketball right now. I would agree with you. Outside of the Philadelphia game, where I thought that they were they weren't good at all. They just no showed like they have like you know ten other times this season. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, I, I think that they are playing better basketball. Um, I, I don't like that you blow a 22 point lead. I don't like that you blow a nine point lead in the fourth quarter, mm -hmm. uh, or a six point lead in the final, you know, whatever, you know, but again, like for me, it's always this weird natural progression of a team of learning how to compete, learning how to, you know, be in ball games late. And then finally learning how to get over the hump and win games. And usually by the time the Kings do that, uh, they have no chance of winning more than like 35 games. So I, I've seen this play out a million times, but this year they just kind of skip way ahead of that where it's just like, Hey, we're going to blow out teams. And then like every third game, they just get blown out. And so there is like this weird disconnect with this season where I would like to tell you that a team can grow from a game where they just flat out, nobody shows up or, or five people, four people that are in the rotation, just flat out don't show up. But I don't think there's a lot you can learn from that. Like you walk into a game, you know, against uh, the Houston Rockets early, which we thought, oh, it's just an anomaly. They just something happened. Right. But that's been a continuing theme throughout the year. They've lost a couple of games to the Pelicans that way. The, you know, the Celtics game, like there's so many games where you just point to and like, where were you guys? Like what would you just didn't even like tr attempt to like put any passion or heart into what's happening. And that's it. That's the reoccurring theme of this season. So to have two losses where, you know, I, again, against two very good teams and you make it a super close game and you probably should have win, but you should have won both of them. That to me is actually progress. I, I don't want to see 25 point losses or 20 point losses or, or 14, 15, 18 point losses. There's just too many of those. And like, again, you walk out of this game here with, uh, with the Suns. You've got, you got a whole bunch of tape of, Hey, we have to be better at this, this, and this, and we would have won. You walk out of the game with the bucks, like, man, we hit our free throws. They win the game like flat out. They, if they, if Malik Monk hits one or two or hits them both and D, or De'Aaron Fox hits one, then we're still playing. Right. And, and that game goes into a second overtime, but those are things where you're like, mental lapses or, or coaching moments. And then again, with the Phoenix thing, Phoenix went small and the Kings didn't have an answer and the coaching staff called timeouts. They tried to work with it. They pulled Sabonis at a point and, and tried to work with it, but then it just became like hero ball and weird, like really random, like forcing everything at the rim, getting blocked, turning the ball over, throwing the ball into the front row. Mm -hmm. Like it was a meltdown and this team has not done that late in games that I can remember outside of the Charlotte game where they just waited to beat the Charlotte Hornets the whole time and then didn't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you allowed Terry Rozier to get, get hot late in a game and, and you turn the ball over a couple of times and you lose. That's the only other game where I can really think of that was built like this game here. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I, I, I think it's, it's something you can grow from. Where these other losses, I don't know how you grow from a, a game where so many people just like don't bring ener energy, don't don't bring any intensity. Do you know what you're gonna get from the Sacramento Kings on a night to night basis? Like, do you have any idea what we'll see versus the Pacers tomorrow night? No, no. And and if I were a betting man, and I don't consider Prize Picks a betting man, <laughs> uh, that's just for fun. But if I were a betting man, I wouldn't touch this team with a ten foot pole nightly basis, not at all. You can't trust them, and that's a problem. So I don't know if it's one player, you know, you make one trade or anything else, but also say, look, at this point, I think that plays into what's happening with sort of the inconsistency. It's been out there for a month, month and a half, that the Kings are shopping guys like Kevin Herter, guys like Harrison Barnes, uh, Davion, you know, Mitchell. Davion Mitchell. Yeah. It's been out there. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't feel good to be in a locker room where you know that any time the, the phone can ring. The, the, the Toronto game where 
everyone is walking into the night thinking this could be the last time we see like three or four of these players and Pascal Siakam could be in the Kings locker room a couple of days from now or the next day. That doesn't feel good if you're a player who's got a family, who's who's put down roots, who has a, a home and a dog and like whatever it might be. It's just really awkward. And to have it be such a long, prolonged situation, yeah. which yeah. the Kings just keep doing. Yeah. I mean, this is not new, but how many other teams do you hear in every single trade rumor? Uh, like three or four. <laughs> three or four. Okay, um, but then there's 20 teams out there that are just motoring through the regular season, not thinking about the trade deadline. Minnesota, have you heard their name once? No. no. They're just cruising along like, okay, see, just cruising along. We're just going to go do our thing. They don't have to worry about things like this. The Kings have to worry about it all the time. And it's been a constant theme of the last five years or four years of Kings basketball. But now I think we're seeing it play out where a lot of these players, like they see that they're being shopped. They see the light at the end of the tunnel. Is it fair? Sorry, Casey. Is it fair to say it was pretty quiet last year? Yeah. I mean, we get through the trade deadline and they did nothing. Yeah. But I mean, it was like, I don't remember. I mean, Harrison was on an expiring contract and we discussed that situation to death leading into the season about what happens if you're playing well, what happens if, you know, chemistry is cooking, like how do you deal with that? And ultimately I feel like the, this trade season, if you will, kind of came and went and I don't feel like it ever really got loud. And I think a big reason for that is how they were playing. It's so loud right now because of the way that they're playing. And the fact that Mike nearly benched a starting two guard in training camp. I don't think that that helped. I see where you're going, and and I agree to a certain extent where it's just like a constant drum beating in the background, that there's something happening, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we go back to last season, they were playing so well that anyone who was thinking the Kings were going to make a move, it wasn't a earth-shattering trading two 17 or $18 million players to try to get a $35 million player. It was Mason Plumlee. Mm -hmm. It was Mason Plumley, or it was Matisse Steibel, mm -hmm. or it was Darius Baisley. There were all of these tertiary players that Good you word. might go add to what you're trying to do and not really change the dynamic of the, you know, the foundation of your team. Now that's not what we're talking about. Right. Uh, you know, and I, I think you're seeing a guy like Kevin Herter find his way through. Finally, he's finally starting to play better. He, looks more like the player we saw last year. The second he does, the Kings look, I don't know. They look different. They look like a 50-something win team right away. You're like, uh, all right, they can go into Milwaukee, and realistically, they should have beat Milwaukee. That's just mm -hmm. that's just bad free throw shooting. It's inexcusable. You got to beat Milwaukee in that situation. You go into Phoenix, you're up by 22. You should have beat Phoenix. That's not like a, you put it on the fence like, well, maybe they could have won that game. No. That's a game you should have had in the win column. And both of those games in the win column, you're 10 games over 500 and you're cruising. Mm -hmm. Now you put yourself in a situation where you're seventh. But even that, I, I this is a the stretch of games coming up will probably define their season. Mm. And it's two games at home and then seven games on the road and then a couple of games after that. Uh, the, this 10 games right here, you should be able to win eight of them. It's but a dangerous I don't know. game to play. <laughs> but it's I don't a know. Dangerous game to play. <laughs> yeah. yeah this team that, did lose to the Hornets like two weeks ago. Yeah. And but that's that's um that's one of the things that we didn't talk about. That I, I think you're you're right, Pam. It does feel like this team can go one way or the other from this moment. It does feel like it's a bit of a fork in the road moment. Um. I feel like they're gonna bounce back. And like, I think they're going to play well tomorrow. Uh, I think they're going to over these next 10 games that you talk about. I think they're going to continue to play well. And the frustrating thing is I don't know if that always is going to result in a W, but I think because of what I've seen from them these past five games on this five game road trip, I think they'll play well, but it does feel like this is a, this is a moment where you can sink or swim if you're just this, this Kings team right now. Yeah. And the tough part is that at any time they could make a trade and you could lose three or four games because you made a trade and, and are you know going through the trade process. That's why they've been trying to push. Like you have these little tiny windows here. Even this weekend, 
you know, they, what do they play tomorrow? And then they don't play again until Monday. Mm -hmm. So you got Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. That's a absolutely perfect time to pull off a trade because then you don't have to, you can get the players in, they can have a practice or two, mm -hmm. get them ready for Monday and away you go. But I don't, there's nothing mm -hmm. imminent. There's nothing imminent right now that I've heard. There's no, you know, earth shattering move that's, that's happening. We heard some buzz last week. I, I think it was Thursday. I started to hear that maybe there was something cooking, uh, that someone thought that there was something coming down the pipeline, but then that quieted down. You know, I, I've heard the Jeremy Grant rumor, uh, you know, sort of the murmurs that the Kings might shift gears and be in on Jeremy Grant, but now he might not be available. Like there's just a lot of things going on. I, I don't believe that. I, I, I think Jeremy Grant's going to be available because if not, like, how are you going to move a 30 year old with $120 million left on, on it when you're a horrible team? Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a lot of question marks there, but that doesn't mean that like, this is a moment where you probably need to do whatever you're going to do. So the team can actually settle in, be who they're going to be, figure out who they're going to have with them the last 40 plus games of the season. And you don't want this to get down to 25 games because you can't really make an impact on a team in the final 25 games of the year. That's more looking forward to next season. And I don't think anyone's ready to look forward to next season yet with this club. I hate that I can hear the announcers now talking about the long layoff the Kings just had. Well, and wow, they're the first game back. They're just so slow and not executing. <laughs> yeah, don't get me started. I'm already preparing myself for that. Incredible. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. So you're are are you and you and you and Kenny kind of along the same the same vibe here. You're not super down with what you've seen the last couple of games. No. The heartbreaker versus Milwaukee and then the obviously disastrous seven minute stretch last night. Yeah, I think those those are major motivational pieces. They are. I, Does this I, team look motivated? That's the part that I can't get over though. You got guys like De'Aaron ain't out there talking to nobody. Like no one's like Trey Lyles is talking. Like that's what we're doing. I mean, like, uh, the, the, are, are we are we sure that they're motivated by this? So, or are we projecting our own feelings about how we'd feel? Well, I can't speak to them not speaking today. Went at, back at home in front of the media, but they sure looked motivated yesterday after blowing that game against Milwaukee. I thought so too. Like they looked like they were pissed and ready. Yeah, they, to play. Yeah, they sure did. For forty two minutes, yeah, they looked motivated, and then they fell apart. They thought they thought they had it in hand. And they, in this case, they let go of the rope in a in a way to collapse, and like lose a game. Then it cost them. It cost them. Like they entitled. They 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 got they they got caught. You know, just being being lackadaisical yesterday. But to answer the original question, like they they lost the game in Milwaukee. They should have won. They looked like they were pissed off and ready to play in that game yesterday for forty two minutes. Yeah, they lost. I think. Like, too, if you look at just the way the, the Phoenix game goes, Phoenix went small and the Kings didn't respond. And, again, I think Mike and his staff, they tried to work with what was happening. They even pulled Sabonis out at one point, and everyone in Sacramento was like, what are you doing pulling Sabonis out? And I, I thought Fox and Monk just made, like, like, mistake after mistake. Like, Fox did not take good shots. Malik running into the key and getting blocked again and again, and, and the three turnovers in the fourth, like none of that was great. They forgot about Keegan completely. He gets one shot, drills a three. They forget about Kevin Herter. It took, they didn't even play him. You probably needed to go back to Kevin Herter at some point just because. Well, you can't because you got to have Harrison Barnes out there because wow. Lord knows Harrison Barnes is never. Me. <laughs> yeah. And then Harrison had the moving screen. I hope someone loves over. me the way Mike Brown loves Harrison Barnes. <laughs> yeah. They're going small. In between. Oh. It doesn't matter. We got to keep Harrison out there. You could have five guards out there. You yeah. could have four guards and uh, in, in in Sabonis out there. I, I just thought it was strange. You know, again, Trey Lyles is a guy who's played really well. And then even when he doesn't put up numbers, it doesn't mean he's not playing well. It just means he's not taking a bunch of shots. And so I, I was surprised he didn't get a little bit of a look again in that game. They The Sasha Vazenkov stuff was so successful in the first half. They barely go back to Sasha in the second half, but they let him, they had him, gave him some burn, but they're not giving him any opportunities. Mm. And that's the problem. I think a lot of times with this team, when it gets into crunch time, it is De'Aaron Fox and Malik Monk show. And sometimes you forget about the other guys. And again, with Sabonis uh, coming out of the game, like 
Sabonis did not adjust to a five, uh, like five shooters on the court for Phoenix. Mm -hmm. He was running back and getting in the, in the paint on defense. And then four guys would walk up ready to shoot a three mm -hmm. and sure he's there for a rebound, but the, the Suns just moved the ball around and played four on five on the perimeter on the offensive end. He kept coming out and trying to set screens at the top of the key. Like he always does. It's like, Hey man, they don't have a big man. You need to get in the post and start raising your hands and calling for the ball. Mm. Like go push Kevin Durant under the basket and dunk on him. Like you do everyone else's size. And so there were, I, I don't want to like let off De'Aaron Fox and who, again, I thought like his shot selection late in the game was, you know, just not good at all. And then the, the turnovers from Malik, but I think it plays into a larger thing that the offense just went to hell in a handbasket. And it was all of their faults. It wasn't one player. Uh, the one guy I'm going to say it's not his fault is Keegan. And maybe it is. Maybe he needed to be yelling, give me the ball. I'm the, you know, he had 18 points. He'd been hitting his shots. So like uh, you can make mis some mistakes like that and, and have a game like that. You just can't have a bunch of games like that. And as long as the Kings win from uh, like learn from it, then I think, you know, okay, this is okay. Uh, again, I think this is, the fourth loss this season I can think of like this, right? Mm -hmm. You got the game where Clay hits the the mm -hmm. shot over Davion. Mm -hmm. um, you've got these two games here, and then you have the Hornets game where, again, the Kings look like they were in control. I think they were up four or five with, with four minutes left and then bad. just forgot how to play basketball for a, a short stretch. And got beat. Well, and that reminds me too. I talked about it earlier, and and that that's probably the the fourth time now that this has happened, and it's just frustrating. So I talked about a situation last night. One thirty four left to go, and Kings are up six, and I'm sitting there in the living room, and I tell Reese, "Is there really what they got to do? Is make sure there's no threes. Like that's your job. Make sure there's no threes." The Suns were spreading them out. For some reason, Sabonis was on Booker. And I'm like, if Booker blows by Sabonis and makes a layup, that's fine. The twos aren't going to beat you. The Suns are going to have to make some threes for you to beat you. Don't allow any threes. At that point, it's kind of, it's it's not like exact science or exact math, but it's almost math. 134 to go. If they go and make two layups because they blew by you and nobody helped on the perimeter, that's you still got the ball for another 48 seconds of the game. Like at some point they're going to run out of time and they, they just, they, they had a situation where Sabonis was guarding Booker. And for whatever reason, I don't know if it's the players, I don't know if it's the coach's strategy, but Keegan Murray inexplicably leaves Aaron Gordon, Eric Gordon goes to double. And that starts a whole scramble. Gordon hits a three on the perimeter. They're up three. They come down, have an offensive possession, don't score. Sabonis, for whatever reason, is trying to deny Booker 75 feet away from the basket, falls down. Booker gets the ball. Now that's another scramble drill, and Durant hits Eric Gordon again for another three. All of a sudden, the game is tied within 30 seconds. And you talk about the Charlotte game. That reminded me. They were up four with about a minute to go, and it's the same principle. No, the three is going to beat you. Do not allow any threes. What happened? They don't get too close to Scary Terry. He step back, sits a three. Now it's a one-point game. Now where are things going to happen? It's a one-possession game. Same thing happened on Sunday. You're up four. Giannis drives to the basket. Stay home. They don't stay home. They leave Brooke Lopez wide open. It's a three. Now it's a one-point game with 11 seconds to go, and it's a one-possession game. These are things that they have to – be aware of somebody where I'm sure the coaches are. I not exactly sure the players always are, but it keeps happening and they got to be aware of score time and situation. Yeah. The, uh, the Kevin Herter mistake, defensive mistake where he almost went to double against Milwaukee mm -hmm. and left a guy wide open in the corner. And it was, what are you doing? Like, what is happening? Why is this happening? Even there's a hidden piece to the final play in Milwaukee. Giannis came to go get the ball and uh, and Monk flew up and denied him the ball. Mm. And so he went to Damian Lillard with five seconds left, having to travel the entire length of the court. I'm having Giannis Antetokounmpo in that situation over Damian Lillard every single step of the way. Go ahead, let him. 
take the ball in. Now you got a guard trying to defend him, but the full length of the court Mm -hmm. where Damian Lillard, the second he gets the ball, he can shoot the ball from anywhere on the court and hit. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I watched him two steps early. Oh, this game's over. Boom, boom. Ball leaves his hand. That's pure. (laughs) Like there was no question in my mind. And that's a problem. So again, even if you break down that play, Fox overplays to try to cut off Lillard, has to race back. Sabonis stays back on on Lopez, but all the way at the three-point line, doesn't push up to where Damian Lillard clearly is going to shoot from because you know the guy can shoot from 40 feet anytime. Mm -hmm. Just these little tiny mistakes that they make, but it comes down to you made a tiny mistake in a game where you made a whole bunch of mistakes. And there are so many ways that it should not have got to that point. You know, you hit the three free throws. It doesn't get to that point. Same with the Suns game. There's a play where De'Aaron Fox is yelling at an official on one end for missing a call. Mm-hmm. Sabonis runs back and is yelling at another official. Herder standing over to the side trying to defend Eric Gordon because he's standing at the three-point line again. And someone just runs right to the basket and dunks while Sabonis is yelling at the official. And you see Herder just walk over to Sabonis like, what are we doing? Like what? Like I can't leave my guy to stop ball because he's hitting all the threes, mm-hmm. and we're having too much conversation with the officials. So, you know, again, I, the Kings, like I, I don't even remember the officials being a part of that game at all, except for maybe De'Aaron Fox got fouled on a three again and he didn't get the call. But outside of that, like it wasn't really about the officials. It was, it was about the Kings not staying engaged one hundred percent the entire game. Mental lapses. Monk shot at the end falls. <laughs> Kings win by one. What are we talking about today? Shoulda, coulda, woulda. Because how much so is different? The shot, the, yeah, the shot goes in. They're three and two on the trip. Everything you've said, James, and everything you've said, Casey, is still the same. But Monk's shot goes in. What are we talking about? Is that stuff being discussed? the learning experience that they they were able to survive. Feels like it's a whole lot easier to learn when the shot falls versus when it doesn't. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, it's just two sides of the same coin. It's a learning experience when you lost or the learning experience when you won. Either way, you got to learn from that game. Mm-hmm. And I think there are teachable moments in that game. It it would certainly feel better. The the I think I think what would change is we still should be talking about the the things that we're talking about, the situational stuff mm-hmm. that that you can improve on and be better, but I don't think we're talking about this team just ain't got it. Like I don't think we're having that conversation. Are we having that conversation now? We did for three hours, two hours. That we don't think the team has it. Yeah, like they they Jesse was saying, like they. they well, no, they I got, didn't. No, I don't but, think we're calling them a playing team. I think okay. we're saying they're in the top six. Yeah. Okay. I don't think that's where we're at. I think right now you're just you're watching it. They are very literally a playing team right now, literally. just to be clear. Yeah. No, I, I know. But I think right now we're watching a team that's just a little off and still trying to figure out who they are. Like they they're having an identity crisis. Part of that identity crisis, we see like glaring issues, the glaring issues that are like Harrison Barnes or or Kevin Herter, you know, both of them having stretches where They just don't look like themselves at all. But then once you get past that, now we're saying, okay, the guys who have been backpacking you for the better part of three months, they're making some mistakes and costing you. Mm -hmm. And and that's tough because it's you become so reliant on the Aaron Fox, Malik Monk, Keegan Murray, and Damana Sabonis. And if they aren't spot on each and every night, Mm -hmm. you don't got a shot. And now the other guys are starting to wake up a little bit and starting to show some life. And it's like, oh, maybe maybe they can be a little bit more of who they were last year. But you got to give these other guys who are exhausted from carrying you for since October. They're going to make some mistakes and they're going to cost you a game here and there. And that's OK, because that's that's basketball. But you just don't want it to be too many of them and and everything else and have it stack up. I still think they're a good team. I just think that they're just a little tiny bit off of who they 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 should be and who they think they can be. And there's so many out, outside factors that go into that. The argument against that, and I think it's fair. I don't I may not agree, 
but I think it's a fair argument that has been laid out today by Jesse and and you kind of said it and others is we're halfway into the season. Like yeah. they they you can make the argument they just are who they are. Like they're gonna I don't know where it's gonna land them ultimately sixth or seventh or eighth, but they're gonna be a team that hovers around seven games over five hundred. I mean, if they win Thursday, that's right. If they beat the Pacers tomorrow, we're at the exact 41 game marker and they're on pace to win 48 games. Yeah. What Sanders. did they win last year? 48. 48 games. And I think they're, I think, I think this team. It's just a different path. Yeah, I think you said that path. earlier. It's a different path to get to 48 I, than it was last year. I think they'll, they'll end up for better or for worse in the same spot they ended up last, not three seed, the, yeah, but yeah. like record wise, about the same type of record. That they had last year is just a different path to getting there. Forty-eight will probably it, on, on pace right now will probably be good for six, anywhere six. from five, six, or seven. Yeah, a lot of that depends on does Phoenix ever turn it on? What's really going on with Utah? What do the Lakers do over the next month? And is this really the Dallas Mavericks? That's the one I'm hung up on the most. Like, is is are the Dallas Mavericks a, a, a seven game over five hundred team? Are they a team that's going to keep a 48, 49 win pace? Because that's a team I, you know, we'll we'll put them on here in just a few minutes when they play the Lakers. But I'm not. That's that's the one that I'm just not sold on. Yeah, because I think at this point, but everyone else around the league is saying that about Sacramento. Yeah, yeah. I, I think right now we can we we know that the Lakers are very iffy. We know mm-hmm. that the uh, although some team out there for some reason is going to magically give them a star level player for nothing, which is like an annual event. Uh, could be Dallas. So, yeah. <laughs> there we go. I, I would expect Atlanta is the one like I've heard yeah. murmurs of where yeah. it's like, oh, what are they going to do here? Oh, OK. Well, does that make them great or not? I, I don't know, but it might make them better. Uh, the Warriors, I think you can just kind of put to the side now. Uh, mm, no, nah, not me. Not me. Can't do it yet. Not there yet. Not yet. I thought not, their big move, they got I, trade pieces. I thought the big trade they were going to try and make, though, was Pascal Siakam. Yeah, but you got to. But now that that's off the table, like. They can. And I, I, don't yeah, I, don't, like, I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Who can know. they get to change their? Just season? let the deadline go, and Chris Paul still be there with his thirty-six million. Dollars. And then, <laughs> then I can write them off. Not because of Chris Paul, because I thought that was always the contract they were yeah. going to turn in. You know, just like they did with D'Angelo Russell and Andrew Wiggins. Like I thought the Chris Paul contract was going to be the next contract they turned into something else. Mm-hmm. When February 9th gets here, fine. Mm-hmm. But until then. That contract's still there, and it can land any player in the league. Yeah, um, I agree. But the problem that they have is that they owe one hundred and eighty-six million dollars in luxury tax this season. Well, I also think they hate each other. I think that's the true problem. <laughs> yes, I, I, yeah. I, I do think co- collectively that group of individuals hates each other. No, I, I don't disagree with that. I would just say, like, Golden how are State they, Eagles? How can they? It's how very can they possible land a player because. Like we did the math last week. If you can shave six million dollars off their payroll, right? So a Harrison Barnes, Davion Mitchell for Moses Moody and and Andrew Wiggins, all Warriors fans are like, oh, the Warriors would never do that, right? That only shaves six million bucks off of their salary. It shaves thirty eight million dollars off their luxury tax and saves them a total of forty four million dollars. Uh, they would do that. They would do that in two seconds. And so. I don't see them going out and getting a player that to take on more salary. It's the other way around. Yeah, I got you. And, and my apologies. It feels kind of weird talking about the Warriors right now. So yeah, we yeah. go on to some some someone else. What about like Phoenix? Like I'm not sold on Phoenix. Not either. Yeah, um, they made me believers for seven minutes last night, though. And that that final stretch <laughs> in the fourth quarter, the, you 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 see it. You know, hey, look at there's Kevin Durant. The but the other I don't thing, know the other thing about last night, and this it's it's not a popular opinion. And, like I said, one man wolf pack over here, but I mean, that was the perfect storm. Everything, what they had like eight threes in the fourth quarter, they had eight threes. The The Kings didn't score for like five minutes or score a field goal for like five minutes. Grace and Allen scored 90 yesterday. It felt like it. He just hit every three pointer there ever was to hit. I mean, yeah, man, that was, that was, that's, that's tough, man, because everything that could go wrong went wrong in that scenario. And you, and you really were losing by two. You needed one thing yep. not to happen yep. that happened, and you, you didn't get that. I, I told you. I, I think I told you both this. When Keegan got the rebound, I was like, "All right, they survived. They're gonna <laughs> they're gonna survive this." He got the offensive rebound, extended the possession, more time off the clock. 
Again, you had another opportunity just to get a single basket. Nope. Nope. Couldn't get it. Yeah, uh, pretty pretty incredible how things fall apart like that. But we also, like we talked about me and Kyle earlier, the other thing is this this isn't a roadmap to beat the Kings. There's only one team in the league that has Kevin Durant. Mm -hmm. And if you can run a, a roster out there with four shooters and one of the greatest shooters of all time and Kevin Durant, you, you got something. Mm -hmm. And it still took... Like, I don't even want to call De'Aaron Fox's defensive play a poor play. Like, at the end of, like, it, it was a foul mm -hmm. without any question. But at the same time, I thought he played that close to as well as you can play it. You can't just give him a wide open look mm -hmm. because he's going to hit it because he's Kevin Durant. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think it was, I'm more of the perfect storm. And I don't even see a trend. It's a perfect storm against two great teams over two days like right it, now if they do this four more times or three more times or or they do the exact same thing against indiana where they just get beat up out of nowhere mm. then yeah we we got a problem but two games against the milwaukee bucks and then the final game of a road trip against a really good phoenix suns team mm. that's tough that sucked last night that sucked i wish they would have won that game that sucked. Watching it collapse was... Weird. Kenny with the Captain Obvious <laughs> moment of the day. <laughs> Not great, Bob. <laughs> Wasn't good. Literally ruined everyone's night. Like, you know how much <laughs> pressure is on that team? It just ruined everyone's night. Yeah. They had... It's the. It's just the... And, 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 and it, but isn't it the perfect microcosm of the, the season? That game encapsulated extreme highs and extreme lows all in a fourth quarter period. That's the blowout losses, the blowout wins. It's the it's the Clay Thompson one point loss. It's the the Kings one twenty four one twenty three win. Like it it encompassed everything that has been this Sacramento Kings season in four quarters of basketball. I even think if you look at the Atlanta game, the how the first half and second half, at least this was three quarters and one quarter. That because we saw the same thing where they they got club or mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. you look at the the detroit game where they gave yeah, up one quarter like what was it 47 in the first 90. quarter they gave up 90 james it, it felt was like 90 points. 300 yes. yeah yeah i think they hit seven or eight we, threes in the first yo quarter. we were kenny and i were chuckling last night no one was firing off jokes about the nuggets in in 76ers being tied at 78 at halftime <laughs> Oh, I remember the, the Kings give up. Oh, please. Oh, they're firing their jokes off, but it's the Nuggets in the 76 or 78, 78. Oh, that's just normal. Mm. Okay. All right. Rough. All right. Well, the Pacers tomorrow. And I assume it's a Bruce Brownless Pacers and a Pascal Siakamless Pacers. And yeah. It's, no uh, Tyrese Halliburton. It's 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 Buddy Heald time at the oh, Golden buddy, One Center, baby. Up. Buddy, oh. gonna get him Buddy up. Buddy healed time at the Golden One Center. <laughs> that man gonna do everything he can to go for 40. <laughs> and get booed the entire time for no reason. Uh, there's, well, there's reason. Eh, I guess, I guess. Shouldn't he just randomly say stuff during a shoot around? When you, I, when, I, when you, when you yell for a city to do something to your anatomy, <laughs> like, it's, that's true. That's true. So it's going to be the TJ McConnell game. It always is. Oh, we've why. seen that before. Ooh, yeah. Oof. We've seen that before. That'd be frustrating. Stephen Brown says, buddy goes for 40 on 40 shots. That checks out. <laughs> yeah. Facts. <laughs> that checks out. Facts. Good kid. Facts. Dad City said, buddy Hill siding in old Sacramento. Let's go interview him. It'd be like Come that on. sometimes. Shivano, Shivano <laughs> with D'Lo and KC. Uh, well, I guess we'll get ready for it. Um, it'll certainly be a a, a, a a slightly different game. Obviously, it, it, it sucks the Pacers one trip here, and uh, Tyrese Halliburton won't be here the next time these two play two teams play on February second. Uh, it's it's obviously going to be a, a different looking team than what they're seeing tomorrow. It, we'll be six days away from the trade deadline. It could be a really really different looking team. Uh, by the next time these two teams play. Uh, but it's a chance for the Sacramento Kings to, I guess, execute some of the lessons that they've learned over the last two games. Either way, we'll be here uh, tomorrow morning, beginning at 10 a.m. with the insider.